Thank you for joining us for tonight's CME webinar, Orthopedics for the Primary Care Physician. Tonight's session will focus on hip and knee. We have three speakers this evening. You will have the opportunity to ask questions by clicking on the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Each speaker will answer questions following his presentation. Our first speaker is Dr. Keith Ledoux. Dr. Ledoux is a board certified orthopedic surgeon who specializes in sports medicine and general orthopedics. His special interests include sports medicine, arthroscopic shoulder and knee surgery, total hip and knee replacement, as well as fracture care. Dr. Ledoux will be speaking on hip pain and arthritis. Dr. Ledoux? Okay. Thank you, Heather. And um, as Heather stated, I'm an orthopedic surgeon. I've been practicing here in Columbus, Ohio now for over 20 years. Um, my talks are going to be on hip pain and arthritis. I'm um, going to kind of touch on a few different topics. First, the anatomy, um, the patient history, physical exam, diagnostic studies, uh, diagnoses. I'm not going to go in depth about diagnoses, but hit on some, and then treatment as well as total hip arthroplasty, and then gonna focus more on uh, the outpatient total hip arthroplasty, uh, what our protocol is. And so to begin with, basically we're talking about the bony structures. You have the femoral head and the femoral neck that make up the femoral side, and then the acetabulum is part of the pelvis. As far as the musculature, we have first the hip flexors that include the iliacus, the psoas, rectus femoris, and the sartorius. And hip extensors include the gluteus maximus, uh, the posterior head of the adductor magnus. Um, then you have the hamstrings that include the semitendinosus, semimembranosus, and biceps femoris. For hip adductors, it includes the adductor magnus, pectineus muscle, and the gracilis. And hip abductors include the gluteus medius, gluteus minimus, tensor fascia lata. Sorry. <laughs> at home for the location <clears throat> that also can help to determine what's going on the location for anterior and groin pain it may occasionally radiate to the interior knee uh, rarely goes below the knee this is usually a hip joint issue when the pain is more in the posterior aspect of the hip or buttocks region and if it radiates down the back of the hamstrings uh, occasionally past the knee and down into the outside or back of the calf and maybe even into the foot. You need to be more concerned of low back pain conditions uh, and or sciatica. Um, lateral hip pain, you wanna think about trochanteric bursitis, iliotibial band syndrome, and then uh, gluteus medius and minimus tendon uh, pathology such as tendonitis or partial tears. Uh, as far as exam, you want to palpate first for the anterior aspect, uh, lateral and posterior aspects to you know, help determine where the pain is located. Uh, as far as range of motion, uh, typically you want to evaluate flexion, which is typically anywhere between 120 to 135 degrees. Extension is uh, 20 to 30 degrees. Ad adduction is about 20 to 30 degrees. Abduction is about 40 to 50 degrees. Internal rotation is about 30 degrees. And external rotation is about 50 degrees. And then you get into the special tests, which the first test is the Faber test I've listed. It, uh, it's the flexion, abduction, and external rotation. And if it's positive, it can su suggest articular hip lesions, uh, iliopsoas pain, and or sacroiliac disease. Then you get in the FADIR test, which is the flexion, adduction, and internal rotation. And if it's positive, this will tend to suggest a labral tear or possibly femoral acetabular impingement. And then there's the log roll test, and you want to do a passive maximum internal and external rotation of the lower extremity and while the patient's supine. And if you get a clicking or popping sensation, then uh, could suggest a labral tear. And then the Thomas test, uh, while the patient's supine, you would fully flex one hip. And if the contralateral hip lifts off the table, there's usually a hip flexion contracture, typically from arthritis. Then you have what's called the Ober's test, where you have the patient uh, positioned laterally with the uh, affected side up. And then you abduct the hip 
and extend it and then you let the hip or leg drop towards the table into some adduction. If it does not adduct, then you su suspect a tight iliotibial band. And then there's the Stinchfield resisted hip flexion test where you just have the patient supine with the knee extended and then you resist hip flexion from about 30 to 45 degrees. And if this causes pain, then it's concerning for uh, intraarticular pathology. And then uh, the straight leg test or Leseg sign, you have the patient supine and flex the hip with the knee extended. Positive test is when you have some gluteal pain or radiating pain down the leg, uh, anywhere between 30 to 70 degrees. And the next is some diagnostic studies get into x-rays. Typically weight-bearing x-rays are best and you can best detect joint space narrowing, um, especially with hip x-rays. It makes it important. You can see here in the diagram that uh, uh, in picture A that there's definitely almost complete loss of the joint space where the joint space is still somewhat maintained on the other side of the hip. And you can get into MRIs and that helps detect detect label tears that you can see here depicted in the images. Also, it can show if there's some partial tendon tears as well as arthritis. I've had uh, some patients that you get x-rays and when they're non-weight bearing x-rays, the hip actually can look somewhat normal um, and you don't see that joint space narrowing, but then you get an MRI and it does show that there's advanced arthritis. As far as diagnoses, then we get into uh, sprain and strains, uh, bursitis and IT band syndrome, uh, low back pathology such as a herniated disc or sciatica, uh, acetabular labral tears, avascular necrosis is also a consideration. And then as far as with arthritis, you get loss of the articular cartilage from the femoral head and acetabulum, and this can lead to uh, obviously joint space loss and then uh, osteophyte formation. As far as treating with sprain and strains, a lot of these are gonna be very similar, but uh, you have the NSAIDs, activity modification, home exercises, rest, ice, and physical therapy. As far as for bursitis and the IT band syndrome, uh, same with rest, ice, NSAIDs, activity modification, home exercises, physical therapy, and in occasionally injections. Rarely surgery is needed. As far as for low back pathology and sciatica, um, similar with uh, activity modification, NSAIDs, home exercises, rest, ice, physical therapy. And then you can get into injections, uh, with epidural injections, cassette blocks. Um, and then if the symptoms continue, ultimately spine surgery may be needed. As far as with label tears, uh, again, start out with NSAIDs, physical therapy. If the symptoms continue, then possible corticosteroid injections could be done. And then if there's definitely tear, then a hip arthroscopy to do a label repair can be done. I do not do hip arthroscopies, but we have one of our partners that does do that. Um, <clears throat> as far as treatment, uh, for next is avascular necrosis. Um, we also treat with some NSAIDs, uh, protective weight bearing, physical therapy. Um, if, if there's no collapse, then possibly a core decompression with grafting. The diagrams here depict one method that's basically a percutaneous method of doing a core decompression. Um, you're not using a drill, so there's less damage to the bone. And you can get up into the area where the necrotic tissue is. And then typically along with this is the lower diagram depicts that we'll do a bone marrow aspiration and you can inject that right up into the necrotic tissue and then backfill it with some uh, calcium phosphate material that helps to keep the bone marrow aspirate up in the femoral head. Plus it helps to strengthen the area a little bit. And then ultimately, if there's collapse, then you get into the joint arthroplasty. As far as arthritis, again, you, uh, rest, ice, NSAIDs, activity modification, home exercises, physical therapy, uh, corticosteroid injections, and then uh, ultimately total hip arthroplasty. 
Hip arthritis is one of the most common and debilitating musculoskeletal disorders. About 28% of the population uh, greater than 45 years old uh, suffer from hip, arthro hip arthritis. Um, uh, modern total hip arthroplasty began in the 1950s by a British surgeon, uh, Dr. Sir, Sir John Charnley. And the diagram pictured below is uh, one of, that he had performed. Uh, after decades of improvement, total hip arthroplasty is one of the most reliable and patient requested surgeries. As far as approaches, there's several approaches to the hip, but most commonly there um, are the posterior approach, uh, direct lateral approach, uh, anterior approach, and I also uh, typically use what's called an anterior lateral approach. The posterior approach is also known as the Moore's or Southern approach. It's the most common surgical approach worldwide. Uh, you're basically going through the gluteus maximus and then take down the short external rotators posteriorly to get to the hip joint. The lateral approach, um, you're going through a different muscle interval and working more anterior to take it down. It's also known as the Harding or transgluteal approach. And this is the second most common approach. And uh, more and more hearing about the anterior approach, which is also known as the Smith-Peterson approach. It's the third most common approach, um, but it's, it can be technically demanding and there's a high learning curve. Um, it usually requires a special OR table called a HANA table, and also you typically need uh, intraoperative x-rays as well. As far as the surgical approach, just to kind of show an animation and highlight of things, but uh, with the normal hip, you have the normal articular cartilage that's on the femoral head and acetabulum that allows typically a smooth movement as people walk and move their hip through a range of motion. And ultimately, as they start to develop arthritis, the articular cartilage will start to wear both on the femoral head and acetabular side. Um, then osteophytes can happen and so the hip joint can start to catch and lock and become very painful and so after they failed uh, conservative treatment options then it's a matter of considering doing a hip replacement obviously you have to make an incision through the skin and to be able to expose the components uh, we do a femoral neck cut and then remount the acetabulum so we can uh, put in the components uh, typically we put in a metal acetabular component first and then there's a polyethylene liner in between and then we put in a femoral stem and uh, the femoral heads attached to that into the uh, femoral canal and that completes the hip replacement and hopefully when all is said and done they're able to ambulate much more smoothly and hopefully less pain or pain free. But uh, total joint arthroplasty has been trending towards the shorter hospitalizations. Uh, many are being done nowadays with one to two day hospital stays. And even more recently, they've been doing them on an outpatient basis. Uh, many ASCs have been performing outpatient joint arthroplasties. There has been a 47% increase in elective outpatient total joints recently. And it is expected that it will be a 77% growth in outpatient total joints over the next 10 years, with inpatient total joints only growing about 3% during that same time period. The benefits of doing outpatient uh, total joint arthroplasty is that hopefully there's less pain. We have uh, different techniques and modalities to help control the pain, which we'll highlight in my next few slides. Um, there's uh, the potential for the lower infection rate. You're not around all the sick people in the hospital and hopefully get them out sooner. Uh, better recovery at home in a more familiar setting that the patients don't become necessarily disoriented very often and, and just more comfortable at home with their family. Uh, also uh, started with faster, more aggressive physical therapy, get the patients going the same day and start physical therapy very quickly as well. And the other benefit is it is cost effective. But this is our uh, total hip uh, outpatient protocol. As far as for pre-op, usually we uh, need to get obviously the pre-op clearance by internal medicine, primary care physicians. 
Um, all patients are required to complete a medical passport, which is basically a detailed patient questionnaire. Anesthesia will then screen the medical passport several days prior to surgery. In addition, we need uh, pre-op blood tests that at least include a CBC, electrolytes, and coags. Uh, the patient's BMI um, preferably is less than 40. Occasionally, we'll do it in the range of 40 to 45, but it depends on medical factors and also depends on the body habitus, if, if depending on where the majority of the adipose tissue is located, that could also delay it or whatnot. If it's a very thin hip or knees, then you can a little bit more easily do it. Um, if there is any ASA level three, that has to be evaluated by the anesthesia several days pre-op to determine if they would be a candidate. And patients with sleep apnea, um, CPAP settings must be less than 15. If it's higher than 15, or if it's 15 or higher, it would definitely need to be done at a hospital setting. As far as for the day of surgery, all patients are to arrive at least one hour prior to the OR one uh, liter of lactated ringers prior to the spinal is given. Uh, Pre-op met nausea medications is also provided that include uh, Pepsid, Zofran, a scopolamine patch if there's no increased intraocular pressure. Typically Decadron, 48 milligrams IV is given. And then also if warranted, uh, Phenergan, anywhere between 12 and a half to 25 milligrams. As far as pre-op pain medications, typically Neurontin is given anywhere between three, three to 900 milligrams PO, uh, either Mobic 15 milligrams or Celebrex 200 milligrams is also given preoperatively. Tylenol, uh, typically 1000 milligrams can be given IV or PO, and then oxycodone five milligrams PO. Um, as far as to con 20 minutes prior to entering the OR, typically anesthesia um, more recently has been performing uh, what they describe as a three-in-one fascia iliacus ultrasounded guided nerve block that uh, will block the femoral, lateral femoral cutaneous and internal obturator nerves. They use, typically will use a dilute 3, uh, 0.375 bupivacaine so as not to inhibit motor function of the vastus muscles postoperatively in no more than uh, 30 to 40 uh, cc's of bupivacaine is used. 10 minutes prior to entering the OR, uh, a bupivacaine spinal is performed, a uh, low dose that typically will last 60 to 90 minutes. The benefits of this is it helps to uh, keep the blood pressure decreased, helps with bleeding, as well as uh, helps with clotting intraoperatively. Uh, also, it lessens the need for narcotics and helps uh, minimize the potential for nausea and post-op sedation. Uh, Interop for pain control, um, careful hemostasis and um, meticulous uh, tissue dissection is needed, so hopefully it lessens the bleeding. Also, we're using either topical or IV transanemic acid or TXA, um, and then Towards the end of the case, typically we'll inject a bupivacaine liposome injection that hopefully will last at least two or three days to give some also pain control. In the PACU, typically the patients will stay a minimum of three hours. We want the pain to be uh, less than a five out of 10, and the patients must walk um, at least hopefully 75 feet and are able to ambulate stairs. Uh, patient must urinate. Uh, we want, obviously want normalized vitals. The nausea and vomiting needs to be controlled. Um, home health can be arranged for that day if needed. And then also if warranted, uh, hemoglobin may need to be checked. Uh, <clears throat> Post-operative protocol, typically I'll use a walker ambulation. Uh, weight bearing is tolerated on the extremity. Uh, find that the walker just tends to be more stable post-operatively compared to crutches, but if patients are adamant and they use crutches. Uh, we'll also start home physical therapy either the same day or the next day and have that arranged ahead of time. And then home health nurse visits if warranted as well. And then post-operatively, hopefully as the patients have gotten better, we'll uh, kind of there's recommended guidelines for returning to activities. You can read through the different uh, activities, uh, typically like golf, swimming, uh, low impact aerobics is okay. Um, 
downhill skiing, cross country skiing, ice skating, rollerblading if they have experience. And then typically you wanna avoid the high impact activities uh, such as uh, running, high impact aerobics, any contact sports, those types of things. So uh, this is somewhat of an old slide, but um, it's still kind of referred to today. I know a lot of uh, orthopedic surgeons are allowing patients to do more stressful things to their joints, but uh, it's still just a concern that that could lead to uh, quicker wearing out of the prosthesis potentially. So but thank you. And <clears throat> this is a case that I did recently. Um, you can see based on the x-rays that they uh, definitely had quite a bit of arthritis. They were bone on bone and had some deformity. Um, we did do this patient in an outpatient setting and uh, everything went real well. The patient was very pleased with their outpatient experience and uh, is recovering very well. Thank you. Any questions? The first question is, uh, do you recommend salon pos patches with lidocaine or flector patches? Um, the patients can definitely use them if, if uh, they're having some pain. Um, not if, doesn't work for everybody, but I wouldn't necessarily discourage it, so. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Ledoux. Our next speaker um, is Dr. Mark Gittens. Dr. Gittens is a board certified orthopedic surgeon specializing in sports medicine and arthritis with extensive experience in outpatient joint reconstruction, including robotic assisted knee joint replacement and anterior hip replacement. Dr. Gittens will be speaking on knee pain today. Dr. Gittens. Thanks, Heather. Um, I might need a little help on getting the screen. I can't get to my screen. I still have Dr. Ledoux's. Dr. Ledoux, can you stop sharing your screen, please? There we go. Perfect, thank you. All righty. So, I'm gonna to talk to you um, tonight about a couple of the passions that I have, and I'll show you a couple of videos on, on how we've done things in New Albany. It's been quite a, quite a ride in how we've done things, but we're gonna talk about some robotics and how they, they fit into knee pain and how we've done that. And, and really something we're all challenged with is really the value paradigm uh, of all this. There, my disclosures for the uh, consulting that I do with the, with the companies to make this happen. But our conventional approach to knee arthritis, uh, and again, this is basically a surgically biased uh, um, talk, um, but our, our conventional um, approach is really just everybody gets a total knee replacement. And this is what we've done for, you know, um, since Insol started this, you know, 30, 40 years ago. Um, but we are seeing some patients decline this. So this study out of Duke uh, showed that 8% uh, of the men, men are sitting on the sidelines and 13% and of women are sitting on the sidelines. This has increased with the COVID uh, crisis. So we're seeing people more disabled and, and more um, deconditioned as they come in. So why do we ask that this, this occurs? Uh, you know, concern for pain, converse, uh, concern for worsening mobility or possibility of infection, how long this is going to keep them out of work, the financial losses. Uh, they've heard the horror story from the one person in the world uh, that they talk to. Uh, and then they just may be poorly informed. Uh, and that's why we do these seminars to try to help as many people as we can become informed with what the new technologies are and what really we see day to day these days. There is a study out of Phil Noble out of Texas that uh, showed that, you know, 18 to 20 percent of the people do have some dissatisfaction. But when you look at that out of, out of uh, when the group out of St. Louis looked at that, the reason there was dissatisfaction is some of the cases were, uh, were just inappropriately done. They were doing the wrong surgery instead of doing total knee replacements. They may have picked the wrong process. Um, and then, you know, there's probably 5% of the patients that really didn't need to even be operated on. They didn't have the right indication. So we need to continue to refine that as surgeons and clinicians. 
Um, but we can do that better. Um, issue number one, when we talk about these four issues that I'm gonna give you tonight is not all patients need total knee replacements. Here's a, you know, not everybody in the world has hypertension, gets the same medications. There are different indications for each medication. Same thing with, uh, with knee arthroplasty. Depending on the type and pattern of arthritis, we uh, really come up with a custom uh, idea of what you may need. Uh, not everybody needs a total knee replacement. This really depends on the pattern of arthritis that you may have, the deformity associated with it, is there a contracture or is it correctable? The stability of the knee and what does your body look like uh, from the soft tissue uh, standpoint uh, uh, of this arthritic condition? We do know if you look at just simple morphologic uh, conditions, about 30% of the patients have really medial compartmental arthrosis, uh, but we certainly don't uh, see that in all practices uh, of being treated that way. Advantages that we may see for people that do have indications for some type of partial knee arthroplasty, accelerated recovery, less pain, less blood loss, a lot of good things, less morbidity. They're, they're done out patients. They're not even in the hospital anymore. Uh, they do provide a, very, a better value paradigm for our, our patients and our healthcare system. The, the knee feels better. It feels more normal. They're able to climb stutter, stairs better. Here's a graph here that shows the difference between total and partial knees and their recovery states. Certainly, uh, we see Dr. people. Hittins, I'm sorry to interrupt. We can't see your presentation. Can you share your screen, please? Sorry, Heather. Thank you. One second here. Let me see where I'm at. How are we doing there now, Heather? Better? We still can't see. Are you? Did you? Did you hit share? There we go. You got it now. I apologize. Now we got it. Yep. Got a lot of buttons here. Sorry about that. No, I'm, I apologize to you. Um, let's see, where are we here? All right, so let me start here on this. Um, there we go. So there's the uh, different types of uh, arthritis. Not everybody gets the same type uh, of implant depending on what type of arthritis that they have. Again, this depends, as I said, on the pattern of arthritis and the deformity associated, what their contractures may look like. Um, here's the slide indicating that, you know, we should see about 30% of the population. We're actually seeing more on the studies that we've done uh, through the Orthopedic Foundation that there are more people that have medial compartment arthrosis. This is the most common type that we see. Again, here's the advantages that I listed of, of uh, opportunities if we're able to help these people. And then here's the recovery slide that we may see. When you look at, at, at options such as stair climbing and strength recovery, a vast difference when you go side to side comparison between partials and total knee replacements. And again, you look at the, the patient satisfaction on how, how many people are happy with their result and why they chose that procedure, significantly different with partial versus total if done correctly. It is a finicky operation and you have to have some experience in doing it. Um, this is what the, this is a patient that we do. Again, we don't do the same thing for every knee, it really depends on the pattern of arthritis that this patient may need to be done. Both of these were done robotically, uh, which really increases our accuracy and reproducibility. What about safety? People talk about safety. This is a, a study done by Jess Lahner out of the Rothman. Um, and so the things that matter to people, do they bleed? Do they have a heart attack? Are they infected? Do they get pulmonary embolism? Are they hospitalized? Do they die after the surgery? We certainly know with robotics and partial knee replacements from this data, over 20,000 patients, they have a two to three times less chance of having sickness or illness or comorbidity issues if they're done the right way with robotics and partial knee replacements. So when we see uh, people that do have comorbidities and they have this type of uh, arthritis, we're certainly uh, very happy to promote that for them because we think it's the best thing and the safest thing for them. Here's a study by uh, Rich Barger out of Chicago at Rush, 135 patients. He's one of the pioneers in doing these outpatient partial knee replacements. Uh, good and excellent results to de demonstrating that these outpatient knee arthroplasties are safe. Um, here's a study out of the Journal of Arthroplasty, a multi-center study that compared people that stayed in the hospital in the old days, three and four days, people that stayed one or two days, and people that were outpatient. Here's the complications in the people that stayed five plus days in this multi-center national study. You can see the list there, everything from DVT to mortality to readmissions and loosening. Here's the one to two day cohort. They were compared and again, they needed some revisions and stiffness in the joint. And then here was the outpatient procedures. Again, some of those people said they had pain in their knee after they had surgery. So a vast difference that we, we continue to see with the literature, the literature that continues to emerge. 
The most important thing is we're people dying after doing what we're talking about right now. And you can see the um, stratification of the patients that stay between five days, three to four, one to two, an outpatient. Certainly there's a, a preponderance that these patients are optimized. And we'll talk briefly about that as we go through the talk, uh, that they can be done and actually are done safer the sooner they can get to home. Um, and the big thing that we're seeing now with this big push from, uh, the, from our government and from, from the insurance companies is that we see significant savings, um, even two years afterwards, up to $9,000 savings if we can get these people uh, done in, in an optimized fashion to our healthcare system. And that benefits our community. It benefits um, the ability to bring new businesses in and certainly saves our healthcare system. Issue number two, um, are we optimize, optimizing the outcomes and the durability um, and how do we do that? Again, you need to look at your x-rays, do stress x-rays, evaluate the pattern of arthritis, pick the right patient, look at the right components, and make sure you've got good, high-quality, um, irradiated, um, high-density polyethylene. Um, those are probably the biggest factors we can do to have durability of these procedures. But the real thing is, how accurate can you put it in? In the old days where I used manual instruments, you heard me say it was a finicky procedure. It was a finicky procedure, and some of those would fail because they weren't reproducible. If you look uh, at the slide on the left, you can see that one is put in nicely. You can see on the, the side on the right, those have edge loading, it's malposition. It will fail. It's going to fracture the medial femoral condyle. So it's incredibly important to have accuracy to implant uh, these components. Again, you have to do these consistently. If you're doing a number of them, they all should look the same. So you can see these, you can look at the second one, they already even had a fracture. Um, they're trying to stabilize it with a screw. Again, uh, edge loading, uh, wrong size of component, components. Uh, the key is to do these well. Um, the evolution of this has really come in with uh, robotics. Initially, the first robotics that we saw were big enough to put into your garage. Uh, but now they're starting to slim down as we go through the, uh, the different phases and generations of robotic surgery. Uh, we find that when we do use robotics, uh, which we take a great deal of pride that we're one of the number one centers in doing that, it simplifies the procedure, it reduces the number of instruments, therefore reducing infection, eliminates steps uh, that have to be reproduced, the bone preparation and the alignment, putting the components in exactly the right way. So when we do this with robotics, we manufacture the, the joint to within one half millimeter. That's 20 thousandths of an inch that we are able to adjust this uh, implant in. And therefore, we can balance the soft tissues. And we now know we can improve the clinical results and long-term results. Um, we're continuing to see uh, the, the vast, vast adoption of these type of technologies with explosion of technology in robotics and sensors. Um, so it is one of the hottest tickets out there. Um, the amount of penetration that we're seeing, we're going to see, you know, 40 to 50 percent of these done in the next five and 10 years with all robotics. Um, total knees are catching up to that as well. Um, a number of companies are now coming out of the uh, out uh, with these robotic uh, programs. Uh, I think every one of the major ones have them. Um, it does cost money as everything it, it does. Some of them need a CAT scan, some of them need an MRI scan. Um, so you need to be cautious or aware of that if you're advising a patient. Some of them don't, and we tend to favor the ones that don't need extra testing, um, uh, but still able to do the soft tissue balance. Um, currently we're seeing you know, at least a third of these, I think it's getting to more, almost 50% are now going into the ambulatory surgery setting. Here's what it kind of looks like when you say, what do you mean by doing robotics? This is a quick video of just how the, the procedure is draped out. Um, we're able to get a great deal of information and surface mapping and um, um, the way the knee will balance through a range of motion, how it tracks. We're able to do all this before we do any cutting at all. So it really gives us um, a great deal of confidence and expertise in using robots to, uh, to line these uh, up. Um, this is how the robot looks. All the information goes from the computer to the uh, resection device. The resection device is now operating at about 60 times per second, the feedback, um, and then we're able to operate the cutting devices at from either zero RPMs to 80,000 RPMs. So this is what it looks like as it does the resection to uh, perfectly place this implant uh, in for the patient. Again, far superior results when you look at this compared to manual instruments with the, with the uh, 
medial uh, unit compartment on the arthroplasty. Implants go in, they're cemented in. Again, these are outpatient procedures, um, and we're able to get this type of uh, result um, perfectly matched, perfectly roll, rolling back prosthesis. Here's uh, some results on how accurate it is when we compare it to our standard manual instruments, which has always been the standard prior to this new robotic uh, explosion. And you can see we're significantly improved three uh, uh, degrees to three millimeters improvement in having reproducibility and accuracy of putting these components in. We had just published some of this in the Journal of Robotic Surgery. Um, again, what's the durability? We're seeing um, point 5% failure rates uh, at five years. So if it's done correctly, the partial knees and the full knees done with robotics uh, is showing that it really uh, does align the knee well and has great durability. What's the value paradigm in knee replacement surgery? We're all pushed. We have a lot of companies asking, for, uh, can we do this and, and have good results? Um, our healthcare costs, you all know, um, are great 17% of the national uh, uh, GDP, uh, you know, we spend over two and a half to three trillion dollars. Um, so it's a big load on us. Uh, so how can you do this? We certainly know we have a, a surge that's going to continue to come uh, as we go into 2030 uh, on all these hips and knees of the baby boomers that are having done. They're needing them done at an earlier age, and they're asking more of their of their joints to to last longer. So payers are encouraging value driven choices. Payers are selecting surgeons in hospital who can do high value uh, work. Uh, there's a big incentive on quality reproducibility. Uh, and we certainly want to optimize the care and the value. Uh, when we look at value, we talk about the patient satisfaction, the implant durability, how fast can they get back to work? Did you have complications? Um, what's the short term and the long term avoidance? Something as simple as don't send your patients to a nursing home after surgery is a huge short-term and long-term cost avoidance. Secondarily, we also know that they have much fewer complications if they don't go to nursing homes and they simply go home. So this is what the value paradigm looks like when we have value, which is equal to quality over cost. This is out of New England Journal of Medicine. But here in New Albany, when we've looked at that, we've kind of taken that paradigm of value and quality and cost, and we've always come up with innovation. We've tried to come up with new ideas, how to service our patients better, how to service uh, the community better. And so with that, that's how we've come up with outpatients and come up with um, robotic surgery as far as that. With that, we've really defined the patient experiment experience. We have a number of visitors that come and visit us all the time, and we're being able to identify best practices. So we're able to identify workflow, physician practice, staff effectiveness, patient family engagement, engagement, service utilization, and utilizing technology such as computers and robots to have optimal throughput uh, for the patient. Here's an example of what we mean by having timestamps to be efficient. So we know exactly when patients come in, every 10 minutes they should have gone through another phase and getting their procedure done. And this is how we are able to track the patients and obviously streamline our facility and the staff to get these people done. Um, we usually tell them you'll come in, you'll have your knee done and you'll be home by lunchtime. How do we get better value costs? We optimize these patients medically so we don't operate prematurely. We'll take our time, try to, uh, to reduce any comorbidities minimize complications because of that. We have these protocols that I just was describing. We need to educate the patients and the family preoperatively. We really try to minimize uh, inpatient facilities. We extremely try to minimize uh, extended care facilities. And uh, we try to move uh, cases to ASCs when at all possible um, and try to pick the right procedure that's the best for the patient and the safest. Not everybody needs to have a total knee. Um, so here's the patient selection and um, one, you got to have a surgeon that knows how to do this and is comfortable doing that. That doesn't fit everybody. You got to pick the right patient. BMI has to be 40 or less. Um, and so if we have to optimize them, we need to optimize them. It's not worth having uh, an infection because of that. Medical history, we need to make sure that we have a good medical history. If they do have something like diabetes, their A1C needs to be below seven. Medical history means we can't be giving shots into the knee. So we don't want to have corticosteroid injections in the knee. Again, studies pretty much show that these are the people getting infected. If they have had a 
uh, an MI or a stroke or a PE, as long as they're away from that event by a year, we're still able to do these people outpatient. Uh, people that are disqualified are someone perhaps with a solid organ transplant, heart transplant, kidney transplant, someone who's on active dialysis. And then we all have some people that we know are psychologically challenged that uh, uh, just may not meet the criteria. So those would be uh, the people that we would exclude. Um, this is a study, again, out of Rothman that showed uh, over a thousand patients and the people that got into trouble, people with, you know, oxygen bearing COPD and people that had cirrhosis or severe coronary artery disease. So some of that is just common sense. Somebody comes in on uh, permanent oxygen, they're probably not the best uh, candidate for aggressive um, outpatient work. Issue number four, is this safe? Does the robotic technology uh, support the healthcare paradigm? And again, so we look at some of Jess Lana's work, 200 cases, 100% of the people discharged at home, only one person came back to the ER, no readmissions. Here's some of the numbers that you see. So you're seeing nine, 10, $15,000 savings to the healthcare system, if these can be done appropriately. So in conclusion, um, partial knee replacements are a conservative alternative to total knees in the right patients. They do return rapid recovery. They can get back to their sport and work very quickly. Less morbidity, less risk, they are safe. And frankly, the patients are happier. Our healthcare system is happier as well. The robots certainly make this from a finicky operation to a very reproducible operation that, we're, that uh, is able to balance the ligaments and the muscles ideally to the preoperative, uh, pre-arthritic stage. And I think that is our, our, our biggest pitch and the biggest thing we can give to patients. And again, therefore, we think the durability and outcome is enhanced. Um, we do feel this is a cost favorable situation, can be done in the ASCs. Um, it does support the value paradigm that we're all uh, utilizing at this point. So thank you for your time on that. I'm gonna break to one video. Some people say, what do you mean by this? And so bear with me. And this is a hip case that I wanna show you, um, but I think you'll get the idea on what we do. Um, Well, I have had a history of orthopedic problems in my lower limbs for a long time. When I followed up with Dr. Gittins, then I found out that arthritis had really started affecting my hip as well. Gradually, I have just you know, been less active. And then a couple of years ago, I retired. And so now I want to be able to do the things that I want to, that, that I want to do when I want to do them. And, and it's just not as easy to do that right now. Being outpatient, there's a lot of benefits to it. And you know, you're in and out, you're back in your own comfortable bed or back in your home. Uh, and so I think the, you know, the healing process just is that much easier for you when you're at, uh, at home. Hey, I'm all for outpatient. <laughs> What I'm expecting today is uh, to go home for lunch, and uh, I think everything will go very smoothly, and I've been looking forward to this, so I'm ready to get started. Just to recap what we talked about in the office, anesthesia will be in, Dr. Betts and his team will be in in just a little bit. They're gonna to talk to you about a number of different things uh, for this. We just completed uh, the right to uh, on an outpatient basis, and everything went smooth. Yeah. Okay, messy check up a little bit. You did great. How's that hip feel? Are you having any pain? Surgical leg in, good leg. So we're going to go up with the good. Yeah, very good. That's again. Superstar. I love it. A plus. Excellent. Good. I'm not at all hesitant to go home and think that I'm gonna have any kind of a medical emergency. They did not push me out the door when I faltered a little bit. Uh, you know, they just held steady right there until I was ready to go to the next step and that's what happened. I'm looking forward to going home, getting comfortable and just letting the recovery stop. So that's one of the uh, videos that um, 
that we had done. I was fortunate to, to work with our federal government. And I, again, this is something we have a big passion for that um, I uh, testified uh, at uh, CMS in, in Baltimore uh, on the issue. And uh, so that was one of the uh, videos that we showed them. Uh, as you know, all the hips and the knees are now going to an outpatient, even for the Medicare Medicaid population. So it was fun to do that, but that's one of the, some of the information we had uh, given them. Um, so all that said, I'm happy to entertain any uh, questions, uh, if there are any. So, so Dr. go ahead, Tether. Did I cut you off? I apologize. No, you're fine. Did you see the questions? Yep, they just came up. Sorry Perfect. about that. So I had a question that uh, uh, I've had patients um, who have bilateral surgeries and have done it at the same time. Uh, what is the opinion on uh, my opinion on that? So currently, if you look at the data, if you're talking um, knee arthroplasty, hip arthroplasty, the, there, there's some significant studies that show with any type of risk, that it's, it's getting more and more discouraged. Um, these are people, one, that have a higher rate of heart failure, pulmonary embolism study out of Mayo Clinic, um, and also they have a higher chance of going to the ECF, and, and we just, there's just so much that, that if we can all avoid it. So routinely in, in our world, we'll stage them. I'll do the unis three weeks apart, do one, come back and get the other one done in three weeks. So really don't go uh, very aggressively and undo bilateral simultaneously uh, arthroplasties. We'll do them staged. Um, what is the additional cost for robotic assisted surgery? Great question. Um, in our, I just got, again, we're kind of known for this as I have people from all over the United world that call us. I just got um, uh, a call from Florida last week and they were asking about that, that there were people charging for that and you really can't do it. It's a part of the procedure how we do it. So the answer is none. Um, um, do I let them jog after surgeries would be another question. For unicompartmental knee arthroplasties, we do let them, I'll let them jog, I'll let them play sports. Uh, the totals, I, I encourage them to try to do more bicycling, but the unis, I will let them jog. And then the last question I have is, do all insurances cover outpatient total knee replacement? Uh, yes, they do. Um, and actually there's a driving force behind all the insurance companies to actually try to encourage this because they're seeing the benefits of uh, a better value and paradigm. Um, we see they, that the patients aren't going to ECFs, the patients are having fewer complications, there's less opioid use, um, the patients are back to work quicker. So I don't know of any that are, are, are um, even like, um, Workman's comp, we can actually do those outpatients. They usually follow Medicare guidelines. So Medicare has been the slowest on this, um, but all the privates uh, do that as well. But for all the above reasons that, excuse me, frankly, the patients do better and it's a better, better value for the uh, patient and our healthcare system. So Dr. Gittins, we have another question. In terms of specific populations in which a partial hip procedure might be optimal for functionality, cost efficiency and recovery time, its effect on sports medicine comes to mind. What are your thoughts on the impact of these innovative techniques may have on the future of athletic related injuries? Was, was the question on partial hip or partial knee? This one is on hip. On hip, so if you look at the partial hip or let's just call that hip resurfacing, it's, it's um, one company's making the, the implant. It has been recalled a, a number of times, um, but there are some, um, quite well-known professional athletes, uh, although one just retired uh, one year after having his done, that have come back and been able to do, to do some of their activities. So that's called hip resurfacing. Again, an extremely finicky procedure. If you look at the, if you look at the literature, 40% of those people still have pain. Uh, so not highly recommended, but there are some case reports, uh, some hockey players and tennis players that have come back. Um, but I think it's more on the rare side. I think most people, um, I don't, I know of only one place in Ohio that's even doing it. I think most people are discouraging hip resurfacing and then going back to, to sport. Partial knees is a different ball game. That's why I asked the question. Would you like to speak on partial knees? On partial knees, I think it's, it's, it's a different ball game. Those people are able to go back and, um, especially if they're robotically, 
uh, produce. Those people can get back to sports. You know, it's very common that they're playing tennis, playing pickleball, running 5Ks. Uh, those people are, are, are golfing in three weeks in our hands. Um, so they, they do really exceptionally well. Do we have any additional questions? All right. Thank you, Dr. Gittins. Our final speaker for the evening is Dr. Jeremy Mathis. Dr. Mathis is a board certified orthopedic surgeon with extensive fellowship training in sports medicine. His special interests include sports medicine, arthroscopic shoulder and knee surgery, and fracture care. Dr. Mathis will be speaking on stress and insufficiency fractures. Dr. Mathis? Thanks, Heather. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Awesome. And I will share the screen. Make sure that this is coming up the way it should. Can you see just the presentation, Heather? I can see, now I can, you're good to go. Awesome. So, give me just a second. Why is that not? It's not allowing me to advance or go back with it in this format. Any thoughts? Do you have it in PowerPoint? Can you do the PowerPoint presentation? Um, it's in, um, there it is. There it goes. All right, so stress fractures uh, and other reasons for pain. So hopefully this is not me or anybody else that we know. Um, so sports medicine. Um, a lot of what I see is we are trying to actually prevent, uh, doing sports medicine, we're trying to prevent a lot of joint replacements. So for example, with younger patients with meniscus tears, we try to fix those, repair those, or clip out the loose part so that there's less stress on the cartilage. And the cartilage is probably the most important part because the wearing away of the cartilage is arthritis, which is why ultimately you need a replacement. Um, similar with ligament tears, we're trying to stabilize the knee. And right now I'm just talking about the knee, there are you know, the other joints as well. But trying to stabilize the knee to minimize the stress on the cartilage to again limit the damage to the cartilage. And then chondral defects, um, similar thing. So what are you guys seeing from a, um, a primary care standpoint? Well, COVID had a lot of patients who were uh, sedentary, less active and potentially weight gain. Um, but then when they, when the COVID restrictions were raised, a lot of people tried to get back at the same level of pre-COVID and weren't necessarily in the same shape. So you've got a lot of people um, at risk for injuries and causing structural damage. So stress fractures, this is kind of the typical um, thing that I think most people think about when they think about stress fracture, especially this time of year, October is when the half marathon and the Columbus Marathon usually happen, um, and people are increasing their activity level. They are either a little bit overweight and trying to lose weight, or they're jogging or they're running more distance or more times a week or higher intensity. So they're giving themselves less time to recover. And recovery is the biggest thing that I talk to patients about is um, you know, think about a Tootsie Roll. If you bend a Tootsie Roll once, it's probably not going to break. But if you bend it over and over and over again, it's, it's probably going to break, hopefully. Um, so stress fracture on the picture on the left, what we call the dreaded black line where the arrow is. Uh, you can see the periosteal reaction. And that's a thicker periosteum relative to the opposite side. Uh, and then that dreaded black line is pretty problematic. And you go to the middle picture and you can see sometimes these can break through. And on the right picture, some of these just go on to healing, but you need to give them uh, lots of time without stressing that um, bone and giving them time. And actually, uh, most of the time I put these patients on uh, non-weight bearing for the stress fracture. So let's talk specifically about knees though. What are some of the common causes for knee pain? Um, first one is synovium, which uh, is inflammation. The next one is cartilage defects, ligament tears, meniscus degeneration, and then subchondral bone, which is where we see bone marrow defects. 
Um, so in the picture on the left, number one is the synovium, so that red beefy painful tissue. Uh, number two is the cartilage, as, we mentioned, as I mentioned before, where when that gets damaged, that's um, arthritis. Um, the next one is the ligaments. So when the ligaments tear, it causes oftentimes an unstable knee, putting undue shear stresses on the cartilage and causing further damage. And then meniscus degeneration, also that increases the stress on the, the cartilage, causing potential damage. Subchondral bone, so bone marrow defects, doesn't necessarily have an effect on the cartilage itself, but a lot of times the thinning of the cartilage adds for increased stress across the bone, and then we see some bone bruising or bone marrow defects of that subchondral bone. That's what I want to address a little bit today. So as I mentioned, uh, synovitis, cartilage defects, tendonitis, and meniscus tears all have fairly similar treatment plans. Uh, physical therapy, ice, activity modification, anti-inflammatories, bracing, potential injections, whether it's steroid versus visco supplementation, and then surgery. Again, what I would like to talk a little bit more about today is the bone marrow defects. Um, so what is subchondral bone? So on the left, you see a picture of the uh, ligament and the joint capsule, the synovium and the cartilage. The subchondral bone is the bone just underneath the cartilage. So it's a spongiform bone. Um, it's cancellous bone and it underlies the cortical bone. The bone defects though, um, subchondral bone defects, often known as bone marrow lesions or BML. Uh, they're defects in the subchondral bone due to trauma, such as microtrabecular fractures. Now they don't have to be a one-time incident. It can be a repetitive over time, even some patients with just walking, uh, where if they have bone on bone and they have pain, a lot of times you'll see the MRI will show bone bruising or um, on a T2 fat sat image, you'll see bone marrow edema, which is what this is. Um, this type of defect can be found near any joint that sees weight bearing or repetitive motion stress. In fact, as the correlate to chronic bone marrow lesions are obesity and poor diet, um, middle aged more so than younger patients, patients with poor joint alignment, and those adults who quickly increase their activity uh, as I mentioned before, with COVID and post-COVID kind of return to activity levels. So microtrabecular fracture, insufficiency fracture, and stress fracture, this is kind of the, um, from one to the next, it's kind of like a, um, uh, not one or the other, but these can be progressive. And what I talk to patients about is think about it as if your bone was an apple. If I take that apple and I throw it against the ground and I can see it break apart, I can see that on an x-ray just like I showed the stress fracture x-ray earlier. Now, if I take that apple and I just bounce it on the table, I can't look at the surface and see that there's much of a difference, but I can push on it and I know there's a soft spot. And that's kind of something similar to what's happening with that subchondral bone. So what are the characteristics of a bone marrow lesion? Well, it's a term for a finding on an MRI that represents a bone defect, again, inside the bone. So even if we do a knee arthroscopy without the MRI, I'm looking at the surface of the bone, not the bone itself. So I can't see this on just an X. A lot of times I can't see this on an X-ray. I also can't see this on a knee arthroscopy. Uh, the subchondral bone defects and micro cracks represent a healing response surrounding these microtrabecular fractures and they're known sources of clinical symptoms, meaning pain. So how's it diagnosed? Again, it's based on clinical history, physical examination, and MRI findings. Um, history and physical examination, these very often present very similar to the way a um, knee arthritis would present or a meniscus tear. Uh, just most of the time patients come in for pain. They're observed only on a fat suppressed MRI, so a T2 fat sat or a um, proton density fat saturation and they appear as a hazy white area against the background of darker bones. So if you look at the image on the left, at the end of the thigh bone, the top of the shin bone, the top of the shin bone, the shade of that dark gray is normal. However, on that medial femoral condyle, that white area or whitish area, that's the bone bruising of almost the entire medial femoral condyle. In the middle picture, you can see, again, proximal tibia, distal femur, that medial femoral condyle that has actually some bone bruising around it, but there's also a cyst, which is what we call often subchondral cysts, 
but you can see that's both on the AP and essentially the lateral or sagittal and coronal views where you see that cyst, which causes increased stress on the bones surrounding the cyst. So that's kind of what's going on with that picture. The picture on the right is very difficult to see. The, um, there is slightly increased whiteness of the distal femur, the femoral condyle. That whiteness, again, is the uh, edema of the bone. So here's a picture of a recent patient x-ray. I don't see anything really that obvious on the x-ray. So I ordered the MRI, and here's the MRI. With the distal femur, the medial lateral femoral condyles look great. That, shade, that dark shade is what is normal. However, you see the medial tibial plateau, that whiteness, that lit up area, is where there's the bone bruising. But then if you look, there's actually a subchondral fracture that's a transverse fracture across the tibial plateau that goes just under the chondral, uh, the um, cartilage. So that's the subchondral fracture. Similar issue here, so, uh, different patient. Distal femur uh, looks pretty good. Yes, you could argue that there are small areas of subchondral edema. Um, those are fairly normal, but you can see that medial tibial plateau lights up really white and um, on a T2 fat sat, that's edema or fluid inside that bone. And again, you can see there's this line of a subchondral stress fracture. So what are your options for these types of patients? Well, a course of conservative treatment may allow the patient to heal the subchondral bone defects. Again, anti-inflammatories, braces, crutches, non-wear, excuse me, physical therapy and non-weight bearing. So if a patient comes into me with, uh, they've had two, three, four weeks of pain, a lot of times they say it's getting worse but they haven't done anything to treat it. So they're still walking on it on a day-to-day -day basis. I try to put them on crutches and give them the option. Hey, we can treat this without surgery, just like putting in a wrist fracture in a cast, it will heal, but it'll require that you're on crutches or a walker or whatever makes you feel most comfortable, sometimes for two weeks or four weeks or six weeks, everybody's different. So what I do is I bring, if they decide that they wanna proceed without surgery, I bring them back every two weeks push on them where I know that bone marrow lesion is to see if they're still painful. If they're still painful, I continue them non-weight bearing so that they give this time to heal. There's other, the other option is to do a surgery. It's called a subchondroplasty. So again, number one, you can diagnose it with the MRI and here you can see the medial tibial plateau. Uh, number two, the red area in this um, image is where the defect is. And then you can fill it with what's called Accufil, which is a um, bone marrow substitute. Now, this substitute is calcium phosphate, so it's a similar material to bone. Uh, it does have good porosity. Uh, it goes in as a liquid, so almost like a toothpaste consistency, and it gets hard within about eight minutes. So again, taking that apple analogy, if I'm pushing on that soft spot of the apple, that's the pain when that apple moves. However, if I can inject um, apple juice into the apple, it goes in as a liquid, gets hard within about eight minutes, now you're pushing on that same spot and there's not the motion or the micro motion and that's what causes the pain. Other alternatives, again, include steroid, uh, hyaluronic acid, whether it's gel one or any other visco supplementation. Um, I do perform a knee arthroscopy with these patients to go in and just look at the area where uh, the subchondral bone was damaged. A lot of times they have grade three and grade four changes of that cartilage. So sometimes the cartilage is completely worn away. I also want to go in and make sure that there's none of the uh, material that's floated into the joint for whatever reason. Um, other procedures include an osteotomy to unload that area of the joint. And then again, arthroplasty, whether it's total joint, unicondylar replacement, or whatever the patient needs. What to expect after this procedure. So it is an outpatient procedure. I tell patients you come in that morning, you leave the same day. I do put them on crutches for about a week to 10 days and I put them in a knee immobilizer. I do give them a block because it helps with pain. And I've noticed that some patients will feel no pain, um, have the block and they'll try to walk on it that same day. With the block, that's not a great idea. They've buckled, they've fallen. So I've gone to using a knee immobilizer for that reason. I usually get them into physical therapy. Uh, within about a week to 10 days, get them moving pretty quickly. Actually, um, I had a 52-year-old SWAT officer who had surgery, who had this procedure done probably about six weeks ago, and he was back to uh, the SWAT team about two weeks ago. So these are working pretty well.
thank you very much. I appreciate you guys' time today. And I see somewhere that there are some questions. Did you find the questions, Dr. Mathis? I did. Do I use cadaver bone for knee surgery? I don't usually use cadaver bone for that, no. I think that there are some, some docs who are putting cadaver bone in, but that's a pretty experimental procedure. Uh, how often do I see the subchondral bone lesions in young athletes? When do I suspect this is the diagnosis? Um, again, similar to stress fractures, when patients say they've had an increase in their activity level, they've gained a little bit of weight maybe, they're getting um, more, high, more number of days with less rest, or they're increasing their intensity, that's when I will uh, get the MRI. And a lot of times I'll try in the younger patients to keep them non-weight bearing. Um, usually I do this procedure in patients over 40. Not that there's rationale to that, I just feel that younger patients probably need to uh, give this time to heal and it's gonna heal on their own anyway. Would I expect to see pathology on a CT scan? Not necessarily because it, the CT scan doesn't show um, the bruising as well, the edema of the bone as well as an MRI. Do I stop patients or students from playing basketball after multiple knee injuries? Uh, it, it depends. So I'll use my lawyer uh, vernacular. So it depends. If there are multiple injuries and it's for a reason, um, you know, if they have malalignment, if it's, you know, they're not training appropriately, if they, you know, all sorts of different things, there's always a potential that they can return. Um, you know, it also depends on, it's, it's always a risk benefit level for me. So if it's a, a potential scholarship athlete and they get injured and you say, okay, is this worth it? For them, it may be. If they are students saying, hey, I'm just playing this for fun to get some stress relief. And they've had, for example, multiple ACL injuries then you, you do have the discussion with them, or I do have the discussion with them is, you know, is this worth it? And I have that discussion with both, both the uh, student athlete as well as the parent. There's a couple more questions, Dr. Mathis. One is, do you use the game ready? Um, I don't use the game ready specifically. Uh, patients, when they go to therapy, they are offered the game ready. I think it's a fantastic device. It's just pricey to get it to go home with patients, um, and most patients don't want to spend that amount of money. And how long do you keep stress fractures non-weight bearing? It depends on the location. It also depends on the, um, the timing. So for example, in the hip, um, the neck of the proximal femur, if the stress fracture is on the bottom side, which is where the bone is compressing, will allow them to start weight bearing a little bit sooner. But if that stress fracture is on the um, more proximal part of the, the more caudal part, that's more the tension side and it's pulling that bone across. So we'll need to make them non-weight bearing for a lot longer. And in fact, sometimes those patients need to have um, screws put across their hips to stabilize that. So it depends on the, the risk of it completely fracturing. What about high school trainers trying to manage knee injuries when it disagrees with orthodox? <laughs> um, Veronica, sounds like you're stuck in the middle of something. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it depends. It depends on what the injury is. Again, I kind of take it as it's a risk benefit. Um, you know, if the student athlete is going to have a potential catastrophic injury, if you allow them to keep you know, doing their activity, uh, it's probably not worth it. Now, that's, you know, if it's a school trainer and an ortho doc, I would probably defer, I'm going to defer to the ortho doc because trainers have some training, but obviously not as much as the doc. Do we have any additional questions? Okay. Well, thank you, Dr. Mathis. All right. Thank you, everybody.
This concludes our webinar. Please make sure that you complete the attestation, evaluation, and assessment forms that were included in the last couple of emails that I sent. Um, your completed forms can be emailed to me at hbenjamin at orthoneuro.com, or you can fax them to 614-823-8883. Our practice liaisons, Jeff Worth and Erica Sharp, will be reaching out to you later this week. Um, please respond to their email with any questions that you might have. Thank you and have a great evening.